Hello, my name is Lorenzo, and I will be your host for the next uh, 60 minutes or so uh, for the uh, Talk and Play session. Uh, Talk and Play is an event about games for everyone uh, that usually takes place uh, every two months uh, here at the Game Science Center uh, since uh, almost uh, five years. And uh, I will now show you a quick jingle for the Talk and Play event so you get uh, a better idea of what it's like. Turn it up. Hey, yeah. If you've got something to say and it's related to games or if you just want to play, I'll tell you this is the place your brain will tingle, you'll mix and mingle. This is the jingle for talk and play. Stretch your imagination. So, Talk and Play, the event, is mostly focused on the uh, local uh, Berlin game scene. And uh, today, as part of our collaboration with the uh, Intel Buzz Workshop, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing, introducing to you uh, Alexander uh, Pipa from uh, uh, Studio Fitzbin. He's the co-founder and CTO of Studio Fitzbin, which is uh, one of the most uh, renowned and uh, respected uh, indie game studios in Germany. It's true, right? It is true, yes. Um, Alexander will be talking today about uh, the making of, uh, of their latest game, uh, The Inner World 2, uh, The Last Windmog, and uh, which was released at the end of last year. Uh, Alexander and myself uh, both work uh, at the uh, Zaftladen, uh, an indie games collective and uh, shared working space uh, here in Berlin. Uh, and since uh, we're in the same office, uh, I had the opportunity of seeing uh, the inner world uh, being developed from start to finish in just uh, one year, which is a very short time for a game uh, of such high production quality. Uh, so I was so impressed by seeing the game being made in such a short time that I asked Alexander to come and uh, talk about it and tell us uh, how they managed to do it. Uh, and share maybe some secrets as well. Uh, so let's please welcome on stage uh, Alexander. So, um, yeah, first of all, thanks for the great introduction. And I want you to welcome all, you all to my little talk about, um, yeah, about how we did uh, manage to produce The Inner World 2 in just a year. Um, as Lorenz already said, I'm, my name is Alexander. And uh, I'm a co founder and CTO of uh, a little games company called Studio Fispin. And uh, yes, we do games and also animation. So, um, first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about who is Studio Fispin and uh, how it came to be. So, uh, Studio Fispin was founded by me, I'm the guy on the left, uh, Smitty and Motti. And uh, Toby joined like after, I think, one and a half years um, when we founded the company. Uh, we founded Studio Fispin now roughly about seven years ago. And uh, since then, We've been working on a lot of stuff. We have released two own games uh, and a lot of other contract work. Um, but yeah, basically it was us four in the beginning, um, which was okay because we had everything we needed. We had code, um, we had the concept, and we had the graphics. Uh, and soon we finally had someone who could uh, manage uh, all the numbers. That was Toby. 
Um, but now, after seven years, we are way more people. Um, so right now we are about 12 in total, and we have a lot of um, artists now on board. We have, I have more coding support, and uh, yeah, we have two offices. So one office is still in Ludwigsburg, where our journey started. And uh, Ludwigsburg is near Stuttgart, uh, and we created our Berlin office uh, three years ago. That's when we also founded the Saftladen. Um, and since then, as I said, we released our first game, which uh, was in 2013, in the summer of 2013. We released the Inner World 1. And half a year later, uh, we won the uh, German Computer Game uh, Award for that, for best German game. Um, it was a very special moment. And uh, yeah, the Inner World 1 was like our student project, so we started at uh, at our university with the project. Um, we started the concept there, and then um, when we all graduated, it was also the day when we founded the company. Um, and after that, uh, we applied for funding for the Inner World One, and actually we got the funding, and uh, we went totally crazy because we were able now to, uh, to um, yeah, to realize or now to produce our uh, first game. Um, yes, but it wasn't our only game we did. Uh, one year later, uh, we released an hour game. Oh, um, when the thing comes back, you're gonna see what I'm talking about. <laughs> we released the next game, um, and this is this was contract work because at Studio Fispin, we like the company thrives from two things. Um, one thing is the own productions, and the other thing is contract work um, to keep the money in, right? Uh, and this was a project uh, which we worked on, which was super cool for us because we uh, worked for a museum. And there we did a huge table where you could play a game with up to 10 people. And uh, if the screen comes back up, um, yeah, you can see it. Um, anyways, so yeah, we did that game in 2014. And in 2015, we, we won our second German uh, video game award. It was for the best innovation, so it's so-called. Um, and um, this was also pretty cool for our company because it would bring more attention to us and also a little bit of funding. Uh, who of you knows of the German video game award? Yeah, okay, so it's around about 50-50. So um, the German Video Game Award is pretty cool, not only because you get the award and the recognition, but also because you get money from it, actual prize money. Um, and you are obliged to use it to produce games, but that's cool, because that's what you want to do anyways. Um, is it coming back? Sorry. Freestyle? Apologies. Apologies. Okay. Can you draw the game? Uh, I'm very bad at drawing, so... <laughs> Anyways, um, so yes, after we did um, the contract stuff, um, we kept working on contract work to uh, keep the studio alive, and we started growing a little bit. So in the beginning, we were only four employed people, um, but we needed more people to, to produce this stuff, right? And then we kept growing very slowly, um, and we were happy enough to work for a very well-known client in Germany. Uh, it's a TV station, I guess, a lot of, of you people know it, it's the VDR. And uh, who of you knows um, Die Sendung mit der Maus? Yeah, some of you. And we didn't make the mouse game, sadly, but uh, you know the blue elephant, right? So we did the game for the blue elephant. Uh, and if we're big enough, we're gonna do the game for the mouse as well. No? <laughs> okay. Um, yes, so, so now you have a picture of what our company is doing. And um, can you? Well, we don't have a picture. Yeah, we, yeah, you don't have a picture, but uh, in your mind there is a picture of what our company is doing. And yeah, sorry. Just no, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyways, so um, 2015, and we worked on another contract stuff the game for the little elephant, but we were eager to go back to our own game. Uh, and we wanted to go back to the inner world um, because 
the inner world was quite successful in Germany. And we thought, hey, if we can do that again, and maybe do the next step, go from Germany to be successful as well and, and uh, internationally, because um, point and click adventures, which the inner world is, uh, or yeah, is, um, are not that you know, are not that sexy outside of Germany. Um, but we wanted to try again, and uh, that's when we thought about doing inner world two. And um, well, the thing is that with inner world one, we were around. 10 people working full-time on it. Oh, it's back. Nice. Um, we were 10 people working full-time on it, but we knew that we want to do Interval 2 bigger, and we wanted to make uh, it look nicer. Sorry. Can we give a big applause to Alexander for the patience? <laughs> Thanks. No video. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so, yeah. And that's when we came back to, uh, to the drawing board and we said, okay, uh, let's try if we can make the inner world 2 happen. And finally, I'm now at the point where I'm gonna talk about the stuff I wanted to talk about, uh, the production of the inner world 2. Because when we worked on inner world 1, it took us two years to finish a game with roughly five to six hours gameplay. Uh, and this was cool. We were working two years on it, uh, our company had work, but it was super exhausting as well because, you know, although we got funding, we had to keep the company running. So besides of making the inner world one, we were also doing contract work. And with the little, like we, we were not enough people to keep it going for a long time, switching from projects and stuff. So we were like, okay, we want to do the inner world two, but this time we want to do it in one year. And this was quite a challenge. And um, I'm, gonna try to give you a picture how we managed to do it. So, there's not gonna be a trailer now, I'm sorry, because uh, the Beamer uh, doesn't like videos, so you have to look at the picture, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the inner world. So, the inner world 2 is a game about Robert, the main character who's trying to play Dart, and uh, Robert is in his world called Asposia, and Asposia is a world that is inside a, a, like a earth bubble. So imagine you have cheese, right? Now imagine the cheese is made out of earth. And now you know the little holes the cheese has? So now imagine on the inside of that hole there are living people. That's basically Robert's world. And uh, in the first game there was a problem because there was an evil dictator. Uh, he was called Conroy and he was ruling the, uh, the world and he was always like making rules and new laws, you should not laugh, you should not dance. Um, and in the end, Robert uh, saved Asposia from this evil ruler and uh, he petrified him and killed him by accident. But uh, yeah, he saved the world. So now, in a world two, um, what's happening? Um, when we started designing the game, it was 2015. Roughly about the middle of 2015 or 16 even? Yes, anyways. So uh, it was the beginning of a very sad topic in Germany, the rise of the new right-wing stuff. So the AfD was coming up after Pegida. And uh, it was a topic that really, yeah, annoyed us a lot. So we were like, okay, let's make a game about it. And um, this is what happened in the Inner World 2. So, Robert saved the world, and then, by accident, he petrified himself, and he was in petrified state for three years. And by another accident, um, he breaks free, and he returns to a world where, yeah, sadly, you don't see it in the picture, but, um, ah, but you see the little button this guy has where a little fascist group has taken over power. And they said, oh, those damn people who petrified our great leader Conroy, they are the source of all evil. And now um, Robert and his friends are being persecuted. So, this is the gist of the Inner World 2. And uh, yeah, how did we get started? So I already told you that we had this idea of we want to make a big game about the right-wing people growing up or the right movement uh, coming up. And uh, we started uh, talking about the story. What would, could happen? And uh, how, could we, how could we introduce this thing that 
although you saved the world in the first game, now it's all back again and you have to do it again. Um, so yeah, we, we went to the drawing board and we uh, had some discussions about that. Uh, and when we had the, the, the outline created for the story, we, and already at that point, we started to create all the tasks and to plan ahead. Because, I mean, this was our second adventure game. We already knew how to do an adventure game, right? Um, so we started to distributing the tasks and the work. And um, remember, we wanted to, the, to do the game in only one year. Whereas for the first game, it cost us two years. So, Sebastian and Flo were starting on the story, together with Annika, our uh, author. Uh, so she started writing the detailed story, and Sebastian and Flo were starting game designing uh, the riddles. Like, because we knew what we want to tell, and in a point-and-click adventure game, you tell it by doing stupid riddles. So they already started on working on the puzzles. And as we knew that we had to be quick, they started doing paper prototypes. Now, I mean, a lot of you already know paper prototypes, I guess. Uh, but for us, this was really the way to, uh, keep in, to keep everything in time. Because what we did is, um, when we had a, a first idea of uh, how the first chapter would be, of the, the first chapter of the game, we would very quickly, you see the drawings, this is all concept art, just print it out and do uh, play testing with people. Um, let's see if there's a picture there. Yes, so usually there would be a video, but anyhow. Um, on the left you see um, the camera that we had above. So we filmed the people that played our riddles while moving the paper around. And I mean, how many of you already have played point and click adventure games? I guess a lot, right? Uh, not so many, okay. So point and click adventure games, you walk around, click on stuff, take stuff and talk to people. Now, you cannot talk to the paper prototype. So what we did is that uh, Sebastian and Flo were always standing behind the players and players would just click, click, point on the paper characters, and then uh, Flo and Sebastian was, would read the dialogue of the game aloud. Um, and we did this for like the first three of six chapters. Um, and this was because digital prototypes would just cost us time that was very valuable. Because in the moment that the one chapter was tested, we already started production on that test chapter. We started producing all the assets that we need in the game. Uh, we would start scripting the riddles and stuff. And at the same moment where we started on producing the game, uh, the, the assets for the first chapter, um, Flo and Sebastian would take about one week to, uh, to go over the feedback from the player testing and incorporate it into the first chapter. So we always knew in the first week we can just start drawing and producing this, uh, um, um, and setting up the scenes in Unity um, because this was the last time slot where the game designers could change anything. And this sounds like, a, a, like horror for game designers if they are sitting here, but uh, yeah, it was needed. Um, so yeah, that would be the video, it, but it doesn't run, right? Uh, well, no. Okay. So, um, but then, um, when we started producing the stuff and we uh, put in the assets, um, during production we found out, hey, um, our engine that we use, so we use Unity, but on top of Unity we built a point-and-click adventure engine that we also used in Inner World 1. Um, that, uh, uh, so the engine was now working and running for the new setup, and then we switched from paper prototypes to digital prototypes for the later chapters. Um, which would save a little time because we didn't have to cut out the stuff. Yes, um, the design process, <clears throat> as I said, was going on parallel to the, as soon as one chapter was done, Tim, our art director, would start drawing like crazy on his notebook and trying to capture the mood. And this was while already the stuff for the next chapter was being design, game, uh, designed by the game designers. Um, yes, yeah, so he used a lot of stuff from his notebook, uh, a paper from his uh, scribble book, and sometimes we just would cut it out directly for the testing, because Sebastian was going over the characters, and he was like, oh, that one looks good for the character in chapter two, give me a scissor, and then he cut it out directly. 
and uh, put it into the paper game. Yes, um, and once the characters got confirmed, um, what, what, uh, what Tim then started doing is character sheets. So you, you, you take the design, you see it on the left, uh, and then you uh, refine it a little bit. Uh, you try to give her some character. This is Mama Dola, uh, a character that uh, greets you in the beginning of the game and will be important later on. And uh, yeah, this is obviously, these are the friendly guys, which uh, Robert is uh, saving exposure from. And um, this was a little bit easier because we knew what we wanted to do with the characters. And also we could uh, recycle characters from the first game. Has any one of you played the Inner World, the first game? Nah, okay. <laughs> so you should play it, definitely. Uh, and not now, but after the talk. And so yeah, for example, uh, the guard, um, we, we could uh, directly use it, the asset from the first game and just use the paint bucket in, uh, um, in Photoshop and make his coat red. And ha there you have a fascist guard. Um, yes. So one thing with point and click adventures um, is that, uh, you know, you have to do the riddles and the riddles are always very deeply knit into the scene you're playing in, right? So, uh, one thing we learned along the way, that when we thought, hey, Flo and Schmidty have one month to do a whole chapter, and then when they're done, we can start producing the assets. One thing that we didn't think through is that first, Tim was very fast in uh, concepting the screens, and second, um, the game designers had one week to change stuff. And in adventure games, if you change a riddle that is deeply located into the scene, you have to reorder the scene. So we had some bumps along the way because Tim had to redo screens he already concepted. Uh, and then it was like, ah, for example, that gear over there, it cannot be there because in the riddle you have to, you, uh, you're not allowed to sue it directly, you have to hide it and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, we did some mistakes in the, um, in the beginning, but changed the order then. And after some refining, this is how a screen looks like in our game. Um, so <coughs> this thing is exported then in several layers. I, this is another screen. This is a, a cell. Yes. So um, this thing is exported then in several layers, imported into Unity. Um, and one thing what we wanted to improve in, from the first game is the first game is the animation in the first game is fully hand drawn. So everything that moves on the screen is single frame animation. Um, <coughs> this comes because first Sebastian and Mariki they graduated from a film school. So we had access to a lot of really, really talented animators. Um, and on the other hand, we loved 2D animation cartoons, right? Um, so in the Inner World 2, <clears throat> we knew that we couldn't do single frame animation anymore because single frame animation is very costly for the hardware because you always have full images <clears throat> and you have 12 images a second of an animation. And uh, second, it's very costly to produce because an animator has to animate the stuff and has to draw a lot of images. Um, so we switched to Spine, uh, which is a puppet animation tool. Who of you know Spine? I guess a lot, right? Yes. Very good. We switched to Spine, and then we started um, animating the background, because in the first game we had a huge problem. We wanted to give the background a lot of uh, uh, living things, but it's very costly because of hand-drawn animation. So what we did in Spine, we just imported the whole scene and gave it to an animator, and he could just draw little thingies that would move in the whole thing. And so all the screens came, came to life. <coughs> um, so, this is at the point where the game design has to be fixed, right? Because when the animator is animating, the assets are already exported, stuff is being animated, which is also very expensive, and parallel to that, we had to start implementing the logic. To the left, you see um, uh, the click areas definition, which we did based, uh, directly in Unity, so the game designers could just uh, create all the click areas and test the game immediately. Um, yes, so we have the graphics, we have the riddles and game design, scripts, and now there's uh, 
talking missing, right? Um, because, as I said, uh, the inner world is a point and click adventure game, and especially it's a, it's a game where you have to talk to characters, and the f game is fully voiced. <clears throat> so, while Annika was writing the script for the game, um, she also had to write all the dialogues parallel to that. And dialogues also were pretty tricky because once you create the dialogue, um, like, I want to talk to that character about the Intel Buzz Workshop. Now, the author goes and writes one dialogue about the Intel Buzz Workshop. The artist start, uh, starts drawing an icon for, you know, because uh, in the menu you select the topics via icons. And um, you really have to be fixed there because then all the text that is done has to be exported and uh, has to go to a recording studio. <clears throat> And uh, we were lucky enough to uh, get Gronk um, for our game um, because as a lucky coincidence, when the first game came out, he played it and uh, that was also very cool for us because we got a lot of traction. And he loved the pigeon so much that uh, when we asked him if he wants to uh, be in our game, he was like, yeah, of course. And also he got uh, the little plushy pigeon there. So you may have seen the pigeon in his videos in the back. Uh, yes, and after 12 and a half months, we were like in the last, uh, uh, um, we were in the, in the last weeks of putting everything in, and it was two months before release because we wanted to release in the 14th months of production. Um, and then you were like, okay, you have your team working on the getting all the assets in, getting everything in. But on the other hand, you have to get the people out to get on events, <clears throat> on to fairs, produce marketing assets, and um, you also have to take care of uh, all, like, our producer had to take care of all the stuff happening with the publisher. So in the end, it got very, like, stress, uh, stressful again. But we managed to do it, and uh, we even got the chance to show the game on the PlayStation Experience in Munich. Uh, in the beginning of, no, in uh, April, April 17, I think. Um, yes, and uh, of course you have to prepare all the store pages and stuff. So in the end, <clears throat> um, The Inner World 2, which is called The Inner World, The Last Wind Monk, was done from April to May. Um, we put 16K of hours work into it. Um, if you count all the days that our team members worked in, it was roughly 2k days. And <laughs> we had 1k hours of meetings. Um, and this was just like the art department talking to animation, how they have to animate this character. Uh, this uh, game design department say, talking to the scripters. Hey, we just finished the first chapter, you have to implement this and that and take care of that. And. Um, Yes, in the very short and stressful QA, uh, uh, I think we had one month of QA, uh, we had roughly about 1,173 bucks reported and fixed. Um, we used Slack at work and it was exploding as well. There were uh, <coughs> a lot of emoticons there. And um, yeah, yes, one, um, one thing that is maybe interesting if you want to make point and click adventure games where it's a heavy and rich in story. So we had 60k of words in the game. And this is pretty bad <laughs> because although um, games with a lot of story are cool to some people, um, this is super expensive and we didn't know that in the beginning. We were like, hey, we want to make the game bigger and stuff, but a lot of things depend on that word count. Um, so you have the audio recordings that depend on the word count. Uh, so more words, it just gets more expensive. Um, the proofreading gets way more expensive. And the translations, because we released the game in five languages. Yeah, this is all stuff that you don't think of one year ahead when you're dreaming of your big dream game, right? Yes, and uh, really, really, really uh, don't forget the time you will spend on uh, events and fairs. For us, this was uh, 165 hours. Um, so, I think, ah no, yes. Um, so in the end, we released the Innova 2 on five platforms. Uh, you can get it on Steam, Xbox One, PlayStation 4, 
uh, iOS and Android. And this was only doable for us because we uh, went uh, uh, for using Unity. Um, and although the console development is very tricky, uh, someone from Unity is here, right? <laughs> yeah. Console development is a bit tricky. <laughs> Um, yeah, but I mean, although it is tricky, it, it, at least it's possible for us. We don't have to do a whole new engine or something. Um, so yeah, we are very glad we could do that. Uh, yes, uh, thanks for this uh, bumpy ride. Sorry for the technical issues and everything. And uh, I hope I could give you some insights. So uh, visit us on Facebook, like us on Twitter. No, follow us on Twitter. And yeah, um, I'm very sorry that I couldn't show the videos, uh, especially of the playtesting. We try it now. Oh, cool. First? Ah, first applause. Okay, cool. Go, go. Oh, oh, oh. How do we do the... Ah, yeah. How do we do the questions with the audience? Let's see how long it is. Where you want to stand, like there? Pepe, you win this for your patience. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'm very sorry. It must be, I don't know, cable, something, something. What, which video do you want to show? Um, yeah, the trailer. Because I was, I'm very bad at explaining the story, so. Well, it's not, it's not easy. There's alcohol. Do we have alcohol <laughs> there as well? Yes. And cartoon. Brrr. Something's interfering. Okay, let's see if it. It doesn't like video. I yeah. Think. Okay. So apparently, uh, yeah, the machine, the projector doesn't like. Let's let's see. Let's see. Can you play a sound, uh, Enzo? Okay. Let's all cross our fingers. Sound sound. Wait wait. Yeah, it's going. Oh, nice. You must find him. Take up the search for the last wind monk. Only then can exposure be saved. Oh. Did you sleep well? What? Now stop dating. Technology. And pay attention. Yeah, I'm and very sorry. We will the hunt projector. down every last flute note. Are you can you hear the sound. complete idiots? That dude cool. always you know seemed what? like a dictator I think to me. The projector is not running on Intel. That's the problem. It's running on the yeah. arm. It's so, but uh, this is a good example. Um, like that trailer, for, um, we had to do it in the last month while we're doing Q&A, um, when we had to come up with all the marketing assets. And one thing uh, that you have to keep in mind if you're going for multiple platforms, prepare your trailer. Uh, uh, you, like you have to have an After Effects or whatever video program you're using. You have to have a project where you can easily swap out the, the, uh, the platform logos in the end, like made for Xbox One and made for PlayStation and stuff. Yeah, because in the first we were like, ah, okay, we'll make the PlayStation trailer, hit render, and the project, like, ah, we just uh, deleted. it. But then it was like, oh, we need another trailer with, yeah, and Im importing, re-importing takes a lot of time. So I think in the end we had like 25 trailers because also you need them for different... This was the USA trailer because of the Peggy thing in the beginning. Then you need a German trailer with the US car. Then you need, an, you don't know, all the ratings and stuff. Logos. So yeah. So now we're going to have like some... Uh, get ready if you have questions for Alexander. Think about it. While you think about it, I ask you one thing. Yes. So I know a lot of uh, indie game developers and the... What happens very often is that somebody says, okay, we're going to do a game, we're going to work on a game, it's going to take us, you know, they do a plan, a roadmap, and they say it's going to take us one year, two years, whatever. And then what happens like nine times out of that, ten is that it takes them much longer, you know. Along the way, you know, they get new ideas, they decide to go in a different direction, and then instead of taking two years, it takes four, five years, or, or maybe they go bankrupt and never release the game. And I was wondering, like, how did you manage to uh, resist the temptation, you know, of like, uh, you must have had along the way at some point saying, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? And uh... um, yeah, the way we solved that problem is that um, I went uh, to a wrestling school and every time the game designers would say, but I want this, I would give him a choke slam and then it was done. No, um, actually, um, 
we, yeah, how did we do it? We learned from the first game that uh, if we go out of time plan, it can be very, very horrible if you don't have the funds. Uh, you're gonna do a lot of overtime and you're gonna crunch to your knees and everything and it's not worth it. And also we knew that um, uh, we really wanted to keep this very, like in the time schedule because we had other projects coming. So what we did basically is, um, Every time we, we were like, okay, we want to change this in the riddle, or it, this makes the game better, we postponed it. And uh, if the game designers had some time, uh, because they finished in chapter six, uh, they finished with designing the last chapter, uh, and uh, the assets were not produced yet, the game designers themselves would just directly go into the scripts and try to hotfix stuff. But uh, I think, yeah, the, the ma my main answer is um, to be, um, to restrain yourself, actually. Um, because you always have ideas that make your game better, right? It's always, you can always polish your game to death. But I think in the end, um, getting it out is uh, also not so bad. <laughs> I see. I see. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, do we have questions here, there, maybe, there, there, over there? Uh, you have one. Uh, uh, uh. But you make mobile games. Okay, versuchen wir No, it's a joke, it's a joke. It was a bad joke. Why? You're making a desktop game, so. Yes, oh, yes, Arnold. Uh, no, I don't want, yes. Try. Yes, hello, oh, yeah, hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I had a maybe technical question for the uh, animation part that you showed with Spine. You only animated the backgrounds with Spine or the characters as well? Uh, no, also the characters. Um, so, and so, so sorry, then, then the next question or the follow-up that I actually wanted to ask, you mixed up background, interaction layer and foreground for characters or how did you do that? Because isn't that two separate things or could you uh, hook into Spine from your Unity code? Um, a little bit, yes. Actually, um, like there are parts that we trigger from the code um, and stuff, but... Um, like the, the the characters which are the characters which are sitting in the screen, um, we kind of directly animated them into the screen, and then we just triggered the stuff we would need, um, because that would save us the time to position. You know, like the art, the animator gives us the file for that character, and then I would have to position it. But if I just would get the character sitting in the full screen, I just didn't have to do anything. So yes, yeah, yeah, interesting. Thanks. You? No, not him, not him. Yes, okay, okay, go, go, go. Yes, please, please. I even, I even have two questions, uh, but I hope quick to answer. A, why one year? What, why the big pressure? And, um, sorry, yep. and B, um, the parallel working process you developed for this uh, time pressure, did you like learn it from somewhere? Did somebody advise you to do it or was it your own idea? Um, so I'm gonna come to A first. Um, so the, um, the Inner World 2 was produced by using partially our funds, and then we got funding from the Medium Board. Uh, thanks for that. <laughs> and we also got funding from the MFG in Baden-Württemberg. Uh, this is where our first studio still exists in uh, Ludwigsburg, yes. And the thing is, what we didn't, so we didn't want to do the same thing we did with Inward One, where we were like, okay, we have a game, um, we exactly know how the game should be, and then we got funding, and then we were like, we have to make this work somehow. And in the end, the somehow was just crunch a lot. So this time, we went the other way around. We collected the funding, we had our own uh, uh, investment, and also we had the publisher, and we just, so yeah, why did we came up with one year? We put all the money together and looked at it and said, okay, our team can live one year from that. And instead of saying, ah, we have to make the game, you know, but it has to be bigger and stuff, we were like, no, we want our team to be fully uh, 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 covered with that money. And that's then to be, um, we were really thinking in how can we make this work? Um, and then, I mean, Sebastian and, uh, and Annika both already had an idea of the story. They split it up into chapters. And then we were like, okay, um, we, we asked uh, uh, Sebastian and, and Flo, how long do you think do you need 
for uh, the game design for one chapter. Uh, we can do it in four weeks, maybe three. And then we were like, okay, um, let's try with four. And then uh, our producer sat down with all the leads, with the concept, with the technical and the artist, uh, the, um, the art director. And then we just moved around all the tasks. This is why we did the task planning in the beginning of the project. So we knew what would have to be done. We moved it around on the calendar and we knew from the beginning we want to fit it in a one-year cycle. And uh, in the end it worked out. I mean, yes, the end weeks were stressful and uh, it could have needed a little bit of more buffer. But um, we are pretty happy with the result. Um, the Metacritics are better than in the first game and although the sales numbers are not as good, um, the perception of the fans is way better than the first game. So. Um, yeah, we think we, we managed to do it. And um, yeah, basically, the main reason is that we already had, we always had that constraint. We want to work as long as we have money for, and not as long as it needs to for the game. How many people? How many people worked on the game in total? 40, 30, like, um, 100. No, it's like 20 something. Um, it's always difficult because. Um, we work with animation freelancers and also um, all like we have a cast of I think 10 uh, voice actors in German alone and then it's another 10 but uh, voice recording was separate so I think the core team was around 20 people <clears throat> yeah anyone else? any anyone more else? questions? over there? over there? Um, oh wow okay uh, did you break even? And if so, how long did it take? Um, ah, okay, yeah, sorry. Um, so the, 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 the break-even is not uh, there yet, no. So we released in September last year. Um, but the thing is that, as I said, the numbers are, were not so good as of the first one. Um, but um, yeah, so we're still waiting for it. But um, it looks like this one, I mean, you can look it up on Steam Spy. Um, and you will see that it's very depressing <laughs> compared to the first one. But on the other hand, the good thing is that we this time we have five platforms, where on the first one we only had two, uh, desktop and iOS. Um, so this time um, we can, although the sales are not magnificent on one platform, uh, we are selling okay on every platform, so this manages to get the money back. Will there be more platforms? Um, maybe, maybe actually, it's a secret. No. Ah, it's just, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You know. I don't know. It's your company. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, but, but you mean for the? Yes. No. No. We don't know. We don't know. Okay. Nothing. Okay. For maybe. the other one? Yes. That's the what? Other. The yes. Ah, exactly. yes. There's only no, one. for the other one. There's only but one platform missing anyway. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Over there. What's the uh, relation to the last Airbender cartoon, or...? Uh... Ah. <laughs> uh, no, uh, but you're not, a, not the first person to ask this question. <laughs> um, uh, but the thing is, um, Air has a lot to do in the story of our game. Um, because uh, the first idea we had um, nine years ago in a workshop, it was a creative workshop from my university and the University of Sebastian and uh, Meraki. And it was a workshop to create a story world around one single world, uh, word. And uh, the topic was brief. Uh, and so we created this world, uh, Esposia, um, that is living on the inside of an earth hole. And there are three fountains bringing the air in. So yeah, air has a lot to, uh, it's, it's very important in the, in the game. Maybe one last, one last. No, yes, no, over there, no, no, no. Can we do what? D, come on. <laughs> Last one, then we try, we try again. Okay. Once again, just, we, we crash the projector and then let's see yeah. what happens. Yeah. Hi. Then we take it. Um, my question would be uh, more in regards to the storytelling. So whenever I see like the inner world, it looks all very cute and um, like family friendly. How, were the, like, how did you tackle like a hard topic like fascism in a game that looks so cute? Um, um, yeah, that's a question that would be perfect for Sebastian, and I'm sad that he's not here. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fine, I'm going to try to answer it. Um, so the thing is, um, we knew that we wanted to 
talk about fashion in our game, but we also knew that we didn't want to make a, a game where we like, yeah, fascists are idiot and you have to kill them all, like in Wolfenstein now, right? Um, so actually the story is written in a way, yeah, sorry, um, or the, the, you experience the story in a way where it exists, uh, and obviously it's not so cool because all the main protagonists suffer it, uh, suffer under the fascism, but it's never like um, no characters really pointing it out. Um, because like also the first game, did you play the inner world? Okay. Yeah, okay. So uh, get back to your pile of shame and do it. Um, well, um, <clears throat> for the concept and, and how we wanted to tell the story also in the first game is that we went with a Simpsons approach. Um, so it's something that works for kids. You know, kids love the Simpsons, but the jokes are actually written for adults. And this is what, how we wrote the Inner One, or not exactly, but we were influenced by that. And the same goes for the Inner World Two. So. No one says that Emil, the main villain in the, sec uh, the second game, is a fascist. But it's not a coincidence that everything is red and white, you know. And uh, yes, that's how we went with that. No problem. Cool. Thank you so much. So now uh, we're getting closer to the end. Uh, I think the program will continue. Uh, who's talking next? Who's talking next? Who's talking next? Somebody? <laughs> so there's no break. There's no break. We co yeah, we continue. We're going to switch the... Co Yes, I think we just give one last big applause because the projector, the projector gods are against us. Thank you. It's happening, it's happening. I told you, don't stop believing. Look at that. Oh, this is pretty confusing. Just like old times. This reminds Bogo of the blood of his enemies. He should go wash it off. Yes, good. I, I hate technology. Thank you, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>